Well, welcome everyone. I am looking forward to tonight's message. Why don't we go ahead, bow our heads, and get right into this seminar tonight. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for a wonderful day. Lord, we ask for your presence to enter into this place. And right now, as Lee shares a message and as Margie shares a message for the kids as well, that we may see Jesus through it all. Thank you, Lord, for your love that you show us um, and that you give us unconditionally. Uh, be with us tonight, and may our hearts be in tune uh, with your will for our lives, too. We thank you and ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And we will begin with the theme song, okay? The prayer for revelation, words again, will be up on the screen. We'll sing along with Buddy as he accompanies us over the PA system. enter your presence seeking your face needing your grace and your wisdom please come and lord we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true let our eyes see and let this be sweet celebration love's revelation you are the center of all that we read and all that we need a song for the ages in these final pages teach us a melody sung by a child redeemed and we will be when you are revealed, and we will be healed, when you are revealed. Lord, we enter your presence, seeking your face, needing your grace and your wisdom. Please come. Lord, we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true. Let our eyes see, and may this be a sweet celebration. Love's revelation, you are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages, love's final pages, teach us the melody sung by a child redeemed. And we will be healed when you are revealed. And we will be healed when you are revealed. Right. You kids, are you ready for this? <laughs> You're going to want to see this. Come on down. Come on, David, Hadassah. Come on down. Oh, they said we went to school today and we're so weary. <laughs> and we need to go home and get ready for our next day of school. <laughs> Come on down. You're such good looking kids. Okay, I'm going to move this here in the middle. Sit right there this time. Sit, have you sit that here way, again, too. That way so these big the young people at can, heart see too. can see, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Did you have a good day at school? Pretty good? Yeah? All right. So have you been to the zoo before? Raise your hand if you've been to the zoo. Have you, Hadassah? Good. It's pretty cool, isn't it? See all those cool different animals? But do you think they'd be a lot happier if they weren't in cages? I think so. A few years back, we went to do a seminar in South Africa, and some really nice people took us for three days to a really awesome place called Kruger National Park. 
It has a great big wall all around the lots and lots of acres of land that is on it. And people come in through a gate and they drive all through Kruger National Park and there's places to stay overnight and everything. But what it is is there is all the jungle animals all over the place, just wild and free. I remember as soon as we drove in, there was great big huge giraffes walking down the road and elephants crossing and rhinoceros family off to the side. Oh, it was so neat. And our friend said, we hope you get to see the big five. Oh, do you know what the big five are? I'm going to show you on the screen, okay? There's the buffalo and the rhino and the leopard and the elephant. And last of all, there's me. I'm the last of the big five. The lion, who a lot of people call the king of beasts or the king of the jungle. I'm not quite sure because in this story you're going to find out he isn't exactly what he thinks he is. But anyway, this lion that we're doing tonight in the story had a little problem with pride. So his nose went up just a little bit in the air. Have you ever noticed that when some people are kind of proud and think they're the greatest? Their nose kind of sticks up in the air, and that's what this lion did. And so, one day, he decided, decided to take a stroll through his kingdom and see how his people were doing. <laughs> and he came up to his people, and he came up to the hyena first. See him up on the screen? Do you know what hyenas do? They laugh. And the king came up to him and said, Hey, Spotty, because he, oh, he has all the spots on him. Who's the king of beasts? And the hyena said, ah, That's easy, your majesty. You are. He said, Good answer. And then he walked on a little bit farther until he came to that guy. What's that guy? A monkey. What kind of noise does a monkey make, you know? Yeah, good job. So he came up. Hey there, little monkey guy. Who's the king of beasts? And the little monkey said, make your noise again. <laughs> you are, sire. That's it. All right, good. That's the answer. Walked on a little farther, and he came up to the zebra. And he said, hey, Stripey, who's the king of the jungle and the, the beasts? What? <laughs> what kind of noise does a horse make? Do you know? Zebras kind of make a noise like that. <laughs> yeah. He said, mm -hmm. uh, you are, your majesty. You're the king of beasts. I said, all right. And he kept on going down the way until he came to that guy. What's that guy? Buffalo, good job. And he said, hey there, big horn guy, who is the king of beasts? And the buffalo had just had some water. He's just kind of swishing it around in his mouth. Mm -hmm. You are, O oh king. All right. And then he went on to that guy. Who's that? The elephant. And he said, hey there, big guy. Who's the king of beasts? Well, the elephant just kept on eating. And he acted like he didn't hear. But with these big ears, do you think he heard? He did. He did. He just didn't want to act like he did. Hey, I know, big ears, that you can hear me. Who is the king of beasts? 
And he didn't even act like he knew what he said. I don't like this. I want all of my subjects to answer me. Big elephant there. Who is the king of beasts? Roar! And the elephant did not answer in words. But this is what he did. He picked up that elephant with his trunk, gave him a good sh lion, sorry, picked up that lion, gave him a great big shake, and tossed him down on the ground. And then he got some water in his trunk, and he shot it all over him. <laughs> and then Mr. Lion tried to get himself back together and shook his head all off and wasn't too pleased. And then he said, you didn't have to do all that just because you didn't know the answer. <laughs> but our story is silly, but it illustrates that sometimes we're like that with God and with people. We get too proud and we think we're the greatest. And we think that other people are below us. And that's not what really what God wants us to be, does he? Who is really the greatest? Only God, only Jesus, right? Not you, sorry. <laughs> oh. But God wants us to remember that he said in the Bible, pride goes before a fall. And you saw that with the lion, didn't you? He thought he was the greatest, and then he got thrown to the ground by big Mr. Elephant, right? And then he realized more that he wasn't the greatest. And we will do well, too, when we realize we're not the greatest, but that God is the greatest each and every day. And you know what? He really is the king of kings, isn't he? And as we get with him and love him more and talk to him in prayer and read about him in the Bible, it takes the pride out of us to where we don't think we're the greatest anymore. We think he's the greatest. We know he's the greatest. And do you know what that makes us since he's the king of kings? That makes you a prince and that makes you a princess and me a princess and him a prince and all of you prince and princesses. Isn't that cool? I want to be that, right? Jesus said, keep coming to me. I'll crowd out all pride. I'll crowd out anything that makes you think that you're better than me or anybody else. And I'll give you the ability to love and see others with my eyes, which are the best. And I want to be like him, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your wonderful animals you made. And thank you that we can learn lessons from them and see about how great you are by looking at their beauty and their just all-around greatness, the way they're all so different and yet so wonderful. And that's the way you made us, too. And I pray more and more we'll remember every day just how special everybody is around us, that you love us all. And you want us all to be a part of your heavenly family one day soon. So please help us to get tight with you now so we can spend forever, eternity with you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, you can go back to your seats. Thank you for staying awake until then. So Kruger National Park, she told you that we got to go to, 8,000 square miles, one zoo, <laughs> 
8,000 square miles, half the size of Switzerland, as large as Wales in the UK, one live um, animal park. Okay, I'm going to say a prayer, then I have an announcement, and then we'll launch into our presentation. Here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to recognize that you are the king, not just the king of the universe, but the king of hearts, and we want you to be the king of our heart as well. Save us from slipping so easily into depending upon ourselves instead of depending on you. Teach us to know you better and to trust you more. And send your Holy Spirit, I pray, that you would open our eyes tonight, spiritually speaking, and our ears, spiritually speaking, and that you would press the enemy away. For Jesus' sake, amen. Okay, just a real brief announcement. Uh, you may or may not have noticed, but there's a music stand at each entrance, and the music stand has a little flyer um, which tells about some products that will be available after the meeting tomorrow night and the following night. We bring the products along with us simply because many times people say, is there any way we could get copies of what you're doing? We'd like to share them with other people. And you need to know that um, we have a website, allaboutjesusseminars.org. Get on our website. Pretty much everything that we have for sale is available for free. You can watch it online, on YouTube, and so on. You don't have to buy it in order to watch it. But if you wanted to have it in format that you can put onto a TV or a big screen or a DVD player or those kinds of things, then we have books and videos and audio MP3s and things like that. So uh, if you have any interest in finding out more about that, you can pick up one of these flyers on, on, the, my, on the music stands on your way out, and then there'll be some things available tomorrow night and then the following night after the meeting. And if you don't buy anything, we're okay with that. We'll love you just as much anyway. Guys, we didn't come here to sell stuff. We just bring it along in case somebody wants to take advantage of it. So I'll leave it there. Now, <clears throat> I want to begin by putting a picture on the screen of some flowers. So, oh, that was, <laughs> that was the thing on the flyer. <laughs> that you can see the flyer and you don't have to see the. All right, so here are the flowers. And you have to admit, as you look at those flowers, that there's some pretty beautiful flowers there. Some beautiful colors. Um, um, <clears throat> try to imagine a bouquet of wildflowers, maybe on a dining room table, beautifying the room. Now, there's something about these flowers. Uh, those are pretty. The ones that were on the previous screen are pretty also. But they are all members of the same family. And the next picture will show you what family they belong to. The Venus flytrap is part of the same family they are. Which means that all the flowers that we just showed you on the screen are carnivorous flowers. That means they eat insects, rodents, and small children. <laughs> no, they eat insects. Um, and... Uh, you see the um, fly or whatever it is that's coming in towards that one. Let's go to the next picture. Oh, yeah, that fly. He doesn't get home for supper because he becomes supper. Um, but when you look carefully, there's a number of little tiny hairs on the inside of the Venus flytrap. And they're like triggers. And if an insect lands inside the area where those little hairs are, if, if an insect bumps into one trigger, no problem. Two triggers, still no problem. But if it bumps a third time into a trigger, then the, then the plant says, okay, sounds like supper was delivered. And they go and they close up on it, and that's the end of that plant, of that insect. Now, <clears throat> what I wanted to do, why I put those up there in the picture on the screen was because the ones I showed you at the beginning, they looked good. They were beautiful. But... They were concealing something that isn't good. Actually deadly for insects. Look good, but deadly in spite of how good they look. Tonight we're going to be looking at chapter 17 and chapter 18 of Revelation. 
And in chapter 17 of Revelation, it begins with an angel showing John, the one who was told to write down the book, the words of the, of the, in the book Revelation. The angel shows John a prostitute who's riding on a seven-headed monster. According to the book of Revelation, she's dressed in purple and scarlet and glittering with jewelry. And the Bible says she sits on many waters. We're going to have a word about that in a minute, but her external beauty is enough to capture the whole world's attention, so it says in the book of Revelation. There's something about her, this woman, that is irresistible, again, according to the book of Revelation. Though she looks attractive, her gold cup that she's holding in her hand holds abominable filth, is what the Bible says. Now, according to Scripture, she's known by many names. But the one that is most familiar to us is Babylon. Earlier, we thought it was a city. Earlier, we talked about how it originated with the Tower of Babel. Uh, Earlier, we talked about King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the city uh, and the nation of Babylon. But this woman is also given the same name, Babylon. Now, I want us to remember something from previous presentation. Babylon symbolizes self-dependence, depending on myself, and pride. It symbolizes pride and self-dependence. And pretty much pride and self-dependence are almost like Siamese twins. They're first cousins, you know. Now, uh, she, this woman, is in league or hooked up with or in partnership with rulers and nations, and she's determined to destroy God's faithful people. She inspires the rulers and nations to attack God's faithful people and to attack the Lamb. But according to Revelation 17, verse 4, it says the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful faithful followers. Now, chapter 17, where she's introduced to us, ends with an angel exclaiming that the many waters that she sits upon represent the people of the earth, the sea, the sea of humanity. You've heard that phrase before, the sea of humanity. And that's what the waters that she sits on represent. Now, in chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, it begins with another angel whose blazing glory, it says, lights up the whole earth. So it's kind of like coming towards us like a comet. And as it draws closer, rapidly closer, this angel has glory streaming from it, and it lights up the whole earth. In verse 2 of chapter 18, this angel cries out, and it says in the Bible that it cries out with a loud voice. Sometimes people who are talking about the message about the angel in this chapter 18 in the book of Revelation, they refer to the message as the loud cry message. The idea is that this angel is calling out its message with so much volume and so loud that the whole earth hears what the angel has to say. And the angel says, Babylon, and remember that's the name given to this woman that we just saw a minute ago, says Babylon has crumbled to ruins and become home to everything evil, detestable, wicked, and unclean. That's what the angel shouts out. Babylon's going down. It's crumbling to ruins. In verse 3 of chapter 18, the angel observes something very interesting. It observes that all, how many did I just say? All have fallen for this woman's seductions. All have fallen. All would include everybody here. All. Nobody exempt. All have fallen for her seductions. The angel observes that all have tasted her wine. That cup she was holding. The angel says presidents have fallen for her. Kings have fallen for her. Businessmen have fallen for her. Great and small, everyone on the planet has done business with or traded with her, according to Revelation chapter 18. 
So now, regardless of what you think about prostitution, everyone on the planet suckers for what she has to offer. Everyone does. So whatever it is that she represents, it must be extremely attractive for everyone to sucker for it. So what is it? What is it that's so attractive? What is it that crosses over every geographical boundary? Doesn't matter what nation you belong to. It's part of every geographical boundary. Uh, what is it that crosses over every socioeconomic group? What is it that permeates every country? All ages, young, old, and in between. And both genders, male, female, what is so attractive? What is, shall we say it this way, the sin, to borrow language from Scripture, the sin that so easily besets, the sin that so easily snares, the sin that so easily captures? What is it that this woman represents? Hebrews 12.1 says, let us throw off everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles or ensnares. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. What is it that captures everybody? It is the idea that I can depend upon myself, that I can do it my way, that I can live my life apart from God. It is self-dependence and pride that this harlot trades in. Self-dependence and pride. And it, it happens to have hooks that go into everybody who's ever been born on planet Earth. This problem is so extensive in our world and in us, self-dependence and pride, that only God can fix it. We can't fix it. Only God can fix it. Now, Last Saturday, I told you that surveys have been taken in every denomination all around the world of the members who attend church, people who come to church. And of the people who come to church, 80% in surveys indicate that even though they attend church on the weekend for a couple of hours, pretty much for the rest of the week, they have little time for God other than perhaps saying prayer before they eat food. So 80% of the average church attendees have little or no daily time with Jesus for the purpose of getting to know him better through his word and through prayer. They don't have what you would call a devotional life. Well, if I don't have time for Jesus all week long, then that means during the week, all week long, I'm depending on me rather than him because in order to depend on him, I have to spend time with him. And if 80% of the people who attend church by their own acknowledgement have little or no time for him, then once again, we see how this suckers the whole planet. It's very attractive, this idea, I can do it myself. Just do it. Do it your way. You know, I, what, what, what's, what's the fast food restaurant that says, have it your way? Which one was that? Is it Burger King? Have it your way. Um, do it your way. Do it yourself. Do it. You know, Nike says, just do it. Um, there's all kinds of these slogans um, that appeal to, uh, you deserve this. You know, you have this coming to you. you you're entitled to this. And it appeals to pride and self-dependence. Now, um, in chapter 18, verse 4, God calls his people to come out of her. Remember now, a name for her is Babylon. And so God calls his people to come out of her. Revelation 18, 4 says, Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. It's God calling to his people. And he says, Come out from her. In the context of this passage, he's referring to Babylon, and he's saying, come out from her, my people. Now, many times I have heard people who preach sermons on Revelation um, 
actually identify a specific denomination as Babylon rather than identifying Babylon as a symbol of self-dependence. And so when they identify a specific denomination as Babylon, then they tell people, in order to come out of her, you can't worship like that nation worship, that, that, that denomination work, worships. You have, to, you have to change the way you worship in order to come out of her. And when they talk like that, they're missing something huge. Because if Babylon ultimately represents self-dependence, it doesn't matter what denomination I belong to, I can live life apart from God in any denomination, even though I might go to church on the weekend for an hour or two and say prayer before I eat food. So to come out of her, my people, well, he's talking to his people, and that gives me some courage. Think about this. Is it possible to be considered by God one of his people and still be struggling with the problems of pride and self-dependence? And the answer is yes. And it gives me courage. It gives me hope. Because he's calling his people. There. So I can be one of his people. Do you remember the children? you remember the disciples? Um, they were on the way to Jerusalem one time. On the way to Jerusalem. And they wanted to have an argument amongst themselves about who was the greatest of the disciples. And they knew they couldn't talk about this in front of Jesus, so they dropped back from behind Jesus so that he, he wouldn't hear the conversation. And then they began to argue with each other about which one of them was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When, 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 when Jesus set up his kingdom, which they believed he was going to set up an earthly kingdom, they were all hoping to be, you know, vice presidents and, and secretaries of state and ambassadors and, and, and chancellors and senators and whatever. They wanted to have position. And so they're fighting with each other about who's the greatest. But I want you to notice some. They were walking with Jesus. Well, of course, they dropped back a little, but they are his disciples. So is it possible to be one of his friends, one of his disciples, and still be struggling with self-dependence and pride? Yes. Does self-dependence and pride take you out of uh, Jesus, away from Jesus? No, he doesn't abandon us any more than a parent abandons a child who's young um, for soiling a diaper. Pa parents don't abandon children for spilling milk or soiling diapers. They recognize these are immature children and they're growing. And parents continue to love them. And the good news is that Jesus and God continue to love us even when we're falling and failing. They don't write us off. They don't kick us out. They don't say, get out of here until you've got your act together. Jesus continued to walk with the disciples, even though they were fighting about which of them was, bad, was the greatest. And by the way, do you remember what was the original sin in heaven? What did Lucifer start the sin problem in the universe with? What was the point he was making? Pride. I'm the best. I am the man. I am number one. I am above God. I will be worshipped. I will be adored. I will be my own God. It started with pride and self-dependence. That's what it started with. And by the way, it went down when, 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 when um, Eve messed up at the tree of temptation. Do you remember what Satan said to her? In the, he, he was speaking through a serpent, but you remember what he said to her? He said, if you eat of this fruit, you will become like gods yourself and you won't need him anymore. You will become as gods. So once again, the temptation was be yourself, do your own thing, be independent. You don't need him. You can run your own show. But as I already said, he calls his people out. So I take courage that as I'm growing and learning to know him better and asking him to clean up the things that need to be removed and cleaned and cluttered in my life, he would do it. But while he's doing it, he calls me his people still. It gives me hope. I told you about the disciples. But let's take them just a little bit further. Upper room. The last night before Jesus is crucified, you all seen the, the picture that was, was it who, who Michelangelo who painted the who painted the Lord's Supper? Leo. Leo. Okay, um, you've all seen that. You're familiar with that painting of all the disciples along the long table. Well, you read the story in the scriptures, 
and they were fighting once again at the upper room for the last supper. They were fighting as to who was the greatest and who should be able to sit closest to Jesus. And not only that, there was a basin of water and towels. And it was sitting there for the purpose of cleaning the feet of each person preparatory for the ceremony that they were all going to be participating in. And typically, someone, a servant, cleaned the feet, washed the feet of every uh, of everybody participating. But there was no servant. So then the unspoken message was, well, there's the towel and there's the water. Who's going to wash the feet? Well, I'm not going to wash the feet. You think I'm going to wash your feet? Are you kidding me? I'm not washing your feet. If you're anybody's going to wash feet, you wash my feet. I'm not washing your feet. Who think you are anyway? Yeah, well, I'm not. Don't look at me. I'm not washing anybody's feet. So none of them were willing to humble themselves. They were full of pride and independence. Not going to catch me doing that. So who ends up washing their feet? Jesus. The one who's actually the master and king of the universe stoops down and washes feet. But it's encouraging to me that he washes them. Why? Because it shows he hasn't written them off yet. They're still full of pride and independence right up to the night he's going to Gethsemane. They've been walking with him for three years. They've been spending 24-7 with him for three years. They've listened to him talk. They've observed the miracles. They've even performed miracles that he's given them power to perform. And now they are on the edge of Gethsemane and the crucifixion, and they're fighting and bickering about being great and independent, and Jesus doesn't give up on them. He doesn't say, I've had enough of it with you guys. Uh, you, did you never going to catch on? Uh, I'm done with you. No. He washes their feet, and then he says to them, meet me in Galilee. I'll see you in a few days. What a beautiful picture of Jesus. I hope you take courage from that because if you're like me, you're aware that you have flops and failures. You have flaws and imperfections. We do. And it can be very discouraging if we look at ourselves and think, man, I'm just not, I'm not improving. But Jesus doesn't give up on us. He says, um, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to clean you. I'm going to still call you my my people. So he calls his people out of pride and self-dependence. I said this has been a problem for the entire human race. And I want to show you a kind of a quick sort of summary, rapid summary progression through Scripture um, to illustrate that. And so I'm going to start with um, King David. In 1 Kings 2, verse 2, King David is talking to his son Solomon. If you're familiar with the story, Solomon is supposed to become the next king when David retires or dies. And David says to Solomon, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Now, what he's specifically referring to here is, I'm about to die. Everybody dies, and that's going to catch up with me before too much longer. So I want to talk to you about being the next king. But there's something else that David could have said when he says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Um, in the King James Version, he says, I'm about to go the way of all men. Everybody goes down this path. He was referring to his death, but his words are true about something that is worse than death. Could there be something worse than death? Well, keep hanging in here with me, and let's see if we can figure out what could be worse than death. Now, if you start out with David's story, remember when he was the shepherd boy who comes and has, has it out with Goliath? You know, everybody knows that story, right? So here's this um, giant, and the children of Israel are terrified. All the soldiers are there. Nobody's willing to go out against him. He challenges the Israelites. He says, let's just have one of your soldiers come out, and I'll come out, and the two of us will fight, and whoever wins, they'll be the one. That army will be the winning army, and we won't have any more war. Nobody else has to die. We'll settle this whole thing in the ring, in the boxing ring. And whoever wins the boxing match, will, that, that whole nation will become the winners. But nobody from Israel would go out, because this guy was like 12 feet tall. This guy was, Shaq would come up to his navel this guy. And nobody would go out. 
If anybody in Israel would go out, it should have been King Saul because first of all, he's king. And secondly, it says in the Bible that King Saul was head and shoulders above all of the other men of Israel. So he was the tallest dude in Israel. So if anybody's going to go up against Goliath, it should have been King Saul. But no, everybody's cowering and hiding. And David comes because his father has sent him to deliver some, some food baskets to his brothers who are enlisted in the army. And when David gets there, here comes a giant and he's calling out curses on God and on the God of Israel and on all the Israelites and saying, all oh, you cowards, nobody come out and fight me. And David says, why isn't someone going up against this idiot? And all the soldiers say, like you, who are you talking about? David says, well, why is anybody going up against him? He's defying the God of Israel. Someone ought to go up against him. And they say, well, not going to be me. Let's see you go. And David says, well, if nobody else will go. Now, this is just a young shepherd boy. He's not even old enough to be enlisted in the army yet. His brothers are, but he's not. And he says, if nobody else will go up against him, I will. He's defying the God of Israel. And we can't let that go down. Well, you remember the story. So David, he goes to a little brook, and he puts five stones into his pocket. He has a slingshot. Goliath has sword, spear, shield, and armor. David has none of that. He has a slingshot and five little pebbles. Yeah, why five? Anybody know why he had five? Goliath had four brothers. And David had one stone for each of the brothers in case that if he once he took Goliath out, if the rest of them showed up, he'd take them too. Then you remember what David said as he rushed towards Goliath? He said, you come out against me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you in the power and strength of the God of Israel whom you are defying. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you dead meat. Because of who I am depending on. So now, can we all agree in this story that David is depending on higher power than himself? Yeah. And he's not full of pride. He's humbly wanting to defend the God of Israel. We know the story. So he, he, he sends off his sling, his stone from his sling, and it hits Goliath in the forehead. And the last thing probably that Goliath said was probably nothing like this has ever entered my mind before. I'm just guessing that's what he said. Anyway, he falls down on the ground, and David takes off the very sword that Goliath had been carrying, and David cuts off the guy's head. So it's over for the Philistine army. That's what happens when David depends completely on God. But then what happens next? Saul is so impressed that Saul asks David to become commander-in-chief of his army. And he asks David to go out and fight our enemies one after another and let's, let's, let's clean up. So David goes out and every time David fights any of the enemies of Israel, he always asks the priest before he fights, would you please inquire of the Lord and ask the Lord if he would have us go up against these enemies or not. And so then the priest would ask God in prayer, David would like to know what your wishes are regarding these people. Should he go up against them or not? And God would say one of two things to the priest. He would say to tell David, go up against them. I will be with him and give him those people into his hand. Or God would say, no, do not go up against these people at this time. So David would not go to war unless he already knew before he went that God was going to give the enemy into his hand. So every time he'd go out, he'd win. But the reason he's winning is because God's giving him the victory. And he doesn't go till he knows God's given him the victory. So you see David's depending on God now, continuing to depend on God. He depended with that Goliath, and now he continues to depend. But then something happens. As David keeps winning because of God's victories, the people confuse the victories and credit David with the... They give David glory. 
And they start singing songs like this. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And you know what happens? When people start praising humans, it's poison. It's very hard to be worshipped and adored and elevated and exalted as a human being without having it mess up your head. And it messed up David's head. And David went the way of all men. Earlier I said, he said to Solomon, I'm going the way of all men. David went the way of all men. And you know the story. He slipped into self-dependence and pride and got to the point where he actually seduced another man's wife. The man happened to be one of the leading soldiers in David's army, but David sent him out and had him deliberately set up to be killed in battle. So David murdered a man, took his wife. How come that happened? Because David went the way of all men. He slipped into self-dependence and pride. Let's go on. Solomon. What? God calls David a man after my own heart. And you know why he calls him that? Not because he slipped into self-dependence and pride, but because in spite of slipping that badly, David repented and returned to God. And he clung to God and said, would you clean up my life? Would you create in me a clean heart? Would you renew a right spirit within me? And God said, I like that. I like that. In fact, God comes to Solomon, which is the next picture we're going to have. And he says to Solomon, as Solomon starts to be the king after his father's retired or gone, God comes to Solomon in a dream. And he says, you know what? I so appreciated your father, which is encouraging, isn't it? Because David fell, but David hung on, and God still looked at him with kindness. God says to Solomon, I so appreciate your father that I'm going to do anything you ask. Whatever you want, you tell me, and I'll give it to you. What do you want? And Solomon said, could I have a night to think about that one? And God says, all right. And so that comes back, God comes back, back to him a night later, and he says, so what do you want? And Solomon says, this is what I want. I don't have a clue how to be king. I don't even know how to go out or come in. And yet I am king of your people. So here's what I want. Would you give me wisdom to lead your people? Because I don't have it. Now, does that sound like a guy who is full of pride and self-dependence? No. So he starts off beautiful. And God says, I like that. Yes, I will give you wisdom to lead my people. And furthermore, I'll give you fame and power and wealth. I'm going to give everything to you because I liked what you asked for. And then the people started praising Solomon. Man, have you seen our king? Have you heard about our king? He's the wisest man in all the world. And rulers from other nations came to meet him. And he becomes, you know... Numero uno. And guess what happens to him? He goes the way of all men too. And what's he end up doing? Read the story. He ends up with 10,000 wives. He offers his own children as human sacrifices. And does pagan worship in pagan temples that he sets up in Jerusalem. What did he do? He started out depending on God humbly. But he went the way of all men. He slipped into self-dependence and pride. And it was a horrible fall. Moses. God uses Moses. The Bible says... God God says about Moses in Scripture, God says, If there is a prophet among you, I will speak to him in visions or dreams, but not so with my servant Moses. With him I will speak face to face as one man to another. So what's God saying about Moses? He's my buddy. He and I talk to each other face to face. We hang out. 
So Moses speaks to God. Do you remember when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments? Remember when Moses comes down from the mountain, his face is glowing? He is radiating the glory of God. You go, you go out to Hawaii in the middle of the day without sunscreen, and you're going to have a face that radiates. It's going to be radiating the glory of the day that was shining on you, and you're going to be sunburned. Moses was sunburned, S-O-N, sunburned. And his face was so bright that the people said to him, please put a veil over your face because we can't bear to look at you. It frightens us to see you glowing like that. So here's a man who glows with God's glory and who talks with God person to person, face to face. God says about Moses, he is the meekest man on the earth. That's humble. Most humble man on the earth. And then they come to the borders of the promised land after having traveled for 40 years. The people start complaining because the water dries up. And they say, what'd you bring us out here for? Just to kill us? Did you just bring us out here because there's not enough graves in Egypt? You brought us out here to die? And Moses is so exasperated. He thinks, we've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of your unbelief and from your lack of faith and trust. And now we're at the borders of the promised land a second time and I want to go in. And you're going back to the very same kinds of attitudes and behaviors that made us go turn out, turn around the last time we got to the border. And so then what does Moses do? He says to those people, he takes the st stick, staff, which God had told him not to use in hitting or striking the rock. God had told him, speak to the rock, and I will cause water to come forth for these people. But Moses is ticked. And he says, must we bring forth water for you miserable people? And then he strikes the rock. What did he just do with that word we? He took credit for what God was going to do. He exalted himself to an equality with God. That's called pride and independence. And God called him the meekest man that ever walked the earth. So what happened to Moses? He went the way of all men. He slipped into self-dependence and pride. Abraham. Abraham's called the father of the faithful. That sounds like people who trust God instead of in themselves. You know the story. God tells Abraham, I'm going to create from you and your descendants a nation that's going to go around the whole world. He says there are going to be so many descendants you're going to have that you, the stars are there more than the stars and more than the sands of the sea. And then Abraham is childless. Oh, by the way, don't forget, Abraham talked with Jesus face to face on more than one occasion. Um, Abraham actually served food to Jesus. Not only that, when Abraham finally realized who he was talking to, because at first he didn't know it was Jesus, then Jesus identifies himself as having come from heaven and he's on a mission sent from God. He says, I'm going to go down and destroy the city of Sodom for its great wickedness. Well, Abraham had a nephew and some nieces and some other relatives in Sodom. So Abraham said to Jesus, oh, come on, please don't, don't do that. What, what, if there's, what if there's like at least 20 people in Sodom that are on your side? Would you preserve the town for that? And Jesus said, well, okay. Anyway, he keeps dickering. Well, what about if there's 10? He just keeps dickering. Think about it. Abraham is on a first name basis with God. Abraham is able to dicker with God. Uh, the Old Testament, God says about Abraham. Earlier we said, he said, he said about Moses, he's the meekest man. And he says, I will talk to him face to face. This is what God says about Abraham. He calls Abraham my friend. He's my friend. 
And the people referred to Abraham as the friend of God. But what does Abraham do? He tries to father a nation with his wife's servant because his wife couldn't get pregnant. So now what has he done? He has slipped into self-dependence. Oh, and here's something else. When they were going into Egypt during a famine and they were going to go stay in Egypt because they had more food down there, Pharaoh started looking at Sarah. And even though Sarah was old, apparently she was very well preserved. And she was so good looking that Abraham was certain the Pharaoh was going to kill him to take his wife. She must have been very well preserved. A few years ago, before my mother died, my mother was in her 80s, as was Jane Fonda. And I happened to see an interview with Jane Fonda in her 80s, and she looked like she was about 39 in the interview. And later that day, I saw my mom. And I said, Mom, Mom, I can't believe it. I saw an interview with Jane Fonda, and she's in her, she's like 82 years old, Mom, and she looks like she's 39. And my mom said, she's had work done. I said, well, mom, they did good work. (laughs) Abraham is thinking, I'm dead meat if Pharaoh gets any more look at my wife. And so you know what Abraham does? He lies. He says, she's not my wife. Don't kill me. She's my sister. Now, when you tell a lie, what are you doing? Think about it. When you tell a lie, you're trying to save yourself. Right? You're trying to save yourself. So what has Abraham done? He has slipped into self-dependence. You see it? He's gone the way of all men. Oh, and he's done, he does that twice. God actually gets him out of jam, the jam in, in, in Egypt. But later on, Abraham's in another country and he starts worrying yet again that his wife is going to get him killed for her beauty and so he lies about her a second time it's not just once a second time still depending on himself my point here is he went the way of all men jacob his grandson he's been told that he will get the birthright he's a twin his brother is supposed to get the inheritance or the birthright but God said, no, I'm going to see that the second born is going to get it. Even though he's a twin, he was second born. God said, Jacob's going to get it. But Jacob went in to his father Isaac and tried to deceive him in order to get the birthright. Now, what is that doing? He's resorted to self-dependence. And he's the son of Ab- grandson of Abraham. Joshua, (laughs) we have a Joshua here in in the building. Joshua, the guy who followed Moses in the leading of the children of Israel. Joshua, the, the children of Israel come to the borders of the promised land, Canaan. And God says, I'm going to take, I'm going to give you this land. And one morning, read the story, it's a pretty interesting story. Joshua gets up early. And he goes outside of the camp to have worship, personal devotions. He's going out to pray. And as he goes out early in the morning, he sees over against the dawn, he sees a warrior approaching. And you have to hand it to Joshua. He's courageous. He puts his hand on the sword, on the hilt of his sword, and he challenges the warrior. He says, who are you? Are you for us or are you against us? Tell me now. Well, he's talking to Jesus. <laughs> he doesn't know it, but he's talking to Jesus. And Jesus says, I will tell you, I am the commander in chief of the armies of heaven. And by the way, you may be able to take your shoes off. He says, the reason I came out this morning was I'm going to give you the battle plan. In fact, here's the deal. I am the battle plan. I'm going to take the Canaanite nations out for you and give you the gift of this promised land. You're not going to have to fight. So now here's Joshua. Think about it, you guys. Joshua is having conversations with Jesus. 
Jesus says, I'm not going to have you fighting for this. This is going to be a gift. You will not be depending on your own strength or power. You'll be depending on me. You guys remember the story. So Joshua goes to Jericho. They walk around. The priests walk. The soldiers don't even go. The priests walk around the city of Jericho. They don't even have weapons. And God causes the walls of Jericho to crumble. And as they crumble and destroy the people within, those who don't perish in the crumble, in fear and panic, end up killing each other. God does the entire job all by himself without any help from from Joshua. Joshua is depending completely on a power other than his own. This is good. And then what does Joshua do? He turns around to his leaders, his soldiers, and he says, whoa, we kicked. Get a handful of our army. Go down there and wipe out Ai. A little town just down the road. We cleaned up at Jericho. Get down there and kick Ai. What did he just do? He went from depending completely on God to assuming the battle in his own strength. So the men go down to take Ai, and Ai kicks them. And they come back beaten, and many of them get killed. And Joshua is ticked. And it says in the Bible that he goes out before the camp because he's lost face. He goes out in front of the camp and he takes ashes and dust and he puts it on his head and he prostrates himself on the ground and he cries out to God angrily and in tears, why did you let this happen to us? And God says to him, Joshua, somebody stole some plunder from Jericho and I had made it clear no one is to take anything from the people you conquer. I cannot bless you while that plunder is in the camp. Now, many people think that the reason that Joshua lost at Ai was because of the plunder, Achan and the plunder. Achan's the guy who stole the plunder from the Philistines. But that's not why. God didn't, Joshua didn't lose because of Achan. Here's why Joshua lost. Joshua lost because he didn't consult God first. If Joshua had gone to God first before sending everybody down to kick in Ai, God would have told Joshua, we have a problem. We've got a guy named Achan in the camp and you need to go deal with him before I send anybody to Ai. But it was because Joshua, who had depended completely upon God, went the way of all men and slipped into self-dependence that they lost at Ai. Elijah wins on Mount Carmel the contest between the uh, false priests, false prophets, 400 of them, and he's the only one representing God. He depends completely upon God. He asks God to send fire down out of heaven to consume the altar and the sacrifice. You know the story. And God does it. That's pretty impressive. It's an empty, clear blue sky. No clouds, no thunder, no lightning. And fire comes out of an empty sky, comes right down to the sacrifice, consumes the sacrifice, consumes the altar, all the rocks, everything. (laughs) Elijah wins by depending completely upon God. That's not the end of the big day for Elijah. There's been a drought for three and a half years. Elijah prays for rain. God sends rain in torrents. In fact, the rain comes in such torrents you call it monsoon around here, I suppose. But the rain comes in such torrents that King Ahab can't find his way back to the, to the palace. His horses can't find the road. So God gives Elijah superhuman strength, and Elijah runs in front of King Ahab's horses all the way home, 18 miles, and guides him back to the palace. This is a man who's depended completely upon God. When he gets back to the palace... Ahab goes in, the king goes in and says to his wife, the queen Jezebel, he says, we lost 400 prophets today. They were all killed because Elijah won the contest. And Jezebel says, get a message to Elijah, who's just outside the city gate. 
Get a message to Elijah. He's dead meat. I'll have his head by this time tomorrow. They come and deliver the message to Elijah, and he takes off running across the desert like a scared rabbit. Now, when you run from somebody who is threatened to kill you, when you run, what are you trying to do? Trying to save yourself. He went from depending completely upon God, he went the way of all men into self-dependence. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. In the Bible, he's even referred to as good King Hezekiah. Hezekiah, he's dying. Prophet comes and says, "You are, you're, you put your house in order because you're gone. You're going to die." He, and Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and begins to pr- pray and to weep. And he asks God if he could have a little more time, a few more years. And God's heart is touched by the prayer, and he says to the prophet, "Go back and tell him I will give him 15 more years." And um, tell him I'm so determined I'm going to do that for him. I'll give him a sign. And if he'd like to choose the sign, he can even choose it. I'll cause the shadow on the sundial to either advance 10 degrees or go backwards 10 degrees. He can decide which. Well, think about it. In order for a sun sh- a dial, for a di- for a sh- in order for a shadow to go forward or backwards, rapidly, instantly, the earth and the sun's relationship have to alter. You try to alter the earth so that you can reverse the sun. This is crazy. When I was just a little boy, I used to love to be in the bathtub. I would start sliding towards the front of the tub. And then I'd push my feet and I'd slide back again. And as I would slide forward and back, the water would start getting Bigger and bigger pushes of water until finally it's like a tsunami and it comes flowing over the top. And my mother would come in and say, what's wrong with that boy? But if you try to reverse the world so that the sun can go the opposite direction, the oceans are going to go spinning out across and you're going to have tsunamis. Uh, Phoenix is going to become beachfront property as Los Angeles disappears. Yeah. So Hezekiah says, I get to choose the sign? Prophet says, that's what God said. Hezekiah says, okay then, make the sign go backwards. And God does. And it's not just for that little local spot. The whole planet is affected. And over in Babylon... There are some astrologers and some astronomers and some scientists who are studying the sky and they actually note the shift. And it's totally unheard of. And they're astounded. And they get the word out. Anybody know what happened? And the word comes back. The God of Israel made that happen for the king of Israel. And you know what? The king of Babylon, and remember, what does Babylon represent? Self-dependence. The king of self-dependence. The king of Babylon sends his wise men to the king of Israel. He says, I want to learn more about that king's God. And so, they come to Hezekiah, and they say, we'd like to know more. And do you know what Hezekiah does? He says, let me show you all my stuff. Let me show you my treasure. Let me show you my gold. Let me show you my silver. Let me show you my menagerie of animals. Let me show you all of the plunder. Let me show you I am an amazing king. I have more stuff than you can shake a stick at. What does Hezekiah do? He goes the way of all men. He's filled with pride and independence. He doesn't even give God any credit. And so the wise men go back to Babylon and they say, well, We didn't find out anything about his God, but he sure has a lot of plunder. And the king of Babylon says, well, I'm going to go over there and take that plunder. How come all this happened? Because Hezekiah went the way of all men. Remember Peter walking on the water? And what's he do? He looks back at the disciples filled with pride and wimps. Bunch of wimps. I'm the only guy who went went for it. Look at you all. You're all just sitting there like wimps in in the boat. Filled with pride and self-dependence. And as he looks back, he begins to sink. And notice what Peter says. He doesn't say, Lord, would you help me? 
Have you ever heard, considered the word help? The word help means I'll do some, you do some. But he didn't say that. He said, save me. That's completely abandoning self-dependence when you say, save me. But he had gone from depending totally on Jesus, walking on water, to pride and self-dependence, and he begins to sink. All in the space of just a minute. I told you I was going to give you a quick survey of scriptural examples of what it means to go the way of all men. And the people I just told you about as we skip through, these are the cream of the crop. These are the giants. These are the spiritual giants. By the way, it's good to know that um, Moses is in heaven right now. And Elijah is in heaven right now. Why is that good to know? Because it tells me God doesn't give up on us when we are full of ourselves. He doesn't give up on us when we are filled with independence and pride. He doesn't give up on us when we neglect him during the week but just show up um, for church. He doesn't give up on us. He keeps coming after us with arms open and heart knocking, hand knocking on our heart. It's wonderful. But it's a message that we're slow to learn and quick to forget. And the message is that God wants us to learn to know him and depend upon him instead of trusting in ourselves. This loud cry message, remember I said the angel was doing a loud cry? The loud cry message is not a warning to stay away from a particular denomination. Even though you may have heard preachers say that's what it is. It's not. The loud cry message is a warning against self-dependence. That's what it is. Babylon is not next door. Babylon lives in me. And God wants to get Babylon out of me. It's not enough for me to come out of Babylon. God wants to get Babylon out of me. He says in Revelation 18, the angel says, Babylon is going to fall. Come out of her, my people. What's that another way of saying now? Let's translate that. Self-dependence, independence and pride is going to go down. So come to me so you're not destroyed when it crumbles. Let's look at it once again, Revelation 18. Come out of her, my people. Do not take part in her sins or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven and God is ready to judge her for her crimes. God's saying the limit has almost been reached. I'm going to destroy self-dependence. I'm going to destroy pride and self-dependence because pride and self-dependence is what started the sin problem in the universe. And he says, we're going to get rid of this forever. Forever. I'm about to destroy it forever. And so he says to his people, come out while you can before I destroy it. Because I don't want you going down with it when it falls. On 9-11, Hadassah, little girl who was here earlier, Gideon's daughter, she was born on 9-11. 9-11. Anyway, 9-11 is a day, a day that many people remember, the towers, the twin towers, right? On 9-11, there were some folks who should have or could have died, but didn't. Interesting statistics. There was a man who was late to work that day because his son had started kindergarten and was having a meltdown, and the father had to stay and calm his son to try and get him to be able to handle being at kindergarten. And because the father was delayed, he didn't he wasn't at his workstation in the Twin Towers when they came down, so he survived. Another fellow was alive after the fall because he had been asked to bring donuts for the office. And he'd gone to the donut store to bring the donuts for the office staff, and they were out of the donuts that he was supposed to get. So he had to go to several other stores before he came up with enough donuts for the office staff. And by the time he had the donuts he needed, the towers were crumbling, and he didn't get killed because he wasn't in them. 
Another woman was late to work because her alarm clock didn't go off on time. Another one got stuck on the Jersey Turnpike because of an automobile accident. Traffic jammed up, late to work. And by the time they got to work, there was no work to go to because the tower was coming down. Had they been on time, they would have been dead. Someone else missed the bus. Someone else spilled food on her clothes and had to take time to go back and change and also to put some stain remover on the garment so that it would, you know, wouldn't set permanently. By the time she got to work, the towers were coming down and she survived because she wasn't inside. Another person's car wouldn't start and they were late to work. Another person went back into the house at the last minute to answer the telephone, ended up talking for a long time to a long-distance call that they hadn't been expecting about some urgent matter somewhere else, and they were late to work. And when they got to work, they weren't in the building that came down, or they would have been killed as well. Another one had a child that was dwaddling and not getting ready for school as quickly as they should, and by the time they got their kid ready for school and off to school, it was too late, and they missed out on being at the tower when the tower crumbled. Another one couldn't get a taxi. They were trying to get a taxi ride to, and all the taxis were filled, and they couldn't get, and by the time they finally got a ride to work, there was no work to go into because the tower was coming down. And one more person's shoes were causing them blisters. They were new shoes, and they were walking. And so they went to a drugstore trying to find where they could get some mole skin to put on the raised red, red spots on their feet so they could survive the day with their new shoes. And by the time they found a store that had the product they were looking for, it was too late, and the towers were coming down, and they were not inside. These are all people who would have died in the Twin Towers on 9-11, but they hadn't been inside when they crumbled. And God is saying to us, come out. She's going down. And you don't need to perish with her. Come out of her, my people. How do you come out of her? The way you come out of Babylon, self-dependence, is by coming to Jesus. Earlier, throughout the presentations, as we've been talking, we've been talking about the importance and the privilege of having a personal friendship with Jesus, of spending time with him every day, not just coming to a meeting at night, not just showing up at church, but having some one-on-one -on -one FaceTime prompt time with Jesus yourself, morning by morning, day by day, making it a priority to start with Jesus. Maybe you're a student and you have lots to do and studies and prepare, preparations and so on. Start with Jesus. Maybe you're all, already in the job workaday world and you have projects and you have deadlines. Start with Jesus. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad and, and the day just overwhelms you with all of the needs and the, and, and the requirements. Uh, start with Jesus. The way you come out of Babylon is by spending time with Jesus. Every person on the planet has this problem. The way of all men. Every person on the planet has this problem. The difference between Christians and the rest of the planet is that Christians come to Jesus to get it removed. Everybody has it. Christians spend time with Jesus to get it removed. When we were here nine or ten years ago, we talked about a three-legged stool. Before talking about the three-legged stool, we said, I want to give you a spiritual recipe. How to grow or bake the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. How can you have spiritual bread? And, and our little recipe said, time alone at the beginning of every day. Take some time at the beginning of your day to contemplate the life of Jesus through his word and through prayer. And then we talked about a three-legged stool. Um, we said, this stool is going to represent a relationship with Jesus. And we said each of the three legs represent the things that we do to support, to nurture, to maintain, or to grow, or to develop a relationship with Jesus. Three legs of the stool. The first leg we said was Bible study, but it's not Bible study to prove things. It's not Bible study to get theological ducks in a row. It's Bible study for the purpose of becoming better acquainted with Jesus as my friend. First leg of the stool. This is a relationship stool. The second leg of the stool is prayer. But it's not prayer to get answers. It's not prayer to claim promises. It's not prayer for 911 emergency calls. It's prayer for the purpose of communicating with Jesus as one would with a friend. Because a relationship 
involves communication. And if a relationship stool represents time with Jesus, communicating with him would be important. And prayer is the second leg of the stool. The third leg of our relationship with Jesus stool is spilling over to others about what you're discovering in the first two legs. As you become more and more acquainted and friend, and, 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 and the friendship with Jesus grows in legs one and two as you spend time with him in his word and talk with him in prayer, then you have something to tell other friends because you want these friends to know this friend because this friend is so cool, you want them to know him too. And as you spill over, it gives you room for more of the water of life, which keeps you from growing stale and stagnant. That's how you come out of Babylon. And it's a daily thing. And as you do that, coming to Jesus, he crowds out all of the other stuff. So Marjorie, we're going to zip through. Keep going. On. Keep going. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. Please keep going. Keep going. Please keep going. Coming to me, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. That's how we come out of Babylon, coming to him. And notice else what he says is pretty cool. The next slide. He says, whoever comes to me, even if I'm full of pride and self-dependence, if I come to him, he says, I'll never cast you out. It's like him saying, look, I know you have problems, but if you can hang out with me, I can fix that. Just keep coming. Let's hang out. Let's spend time. I'll fix what needs fixing. That's the message of the angel of the loud cry. Time with Jesus. The message is not get out of false churches and avoid uh, particular denominations. The message is spend time with Jesus daily so that he can crowd self-dependence and pride out of my heart and your heart. Listen to the song, but he's going to sing for our close. When your heart is heavy laden Feeling like the joy is fading Just come Come Believing everything I told you Here are arms that long to hold you Just come Behind the mask you're hiding Here is someone to confide in I know what you've done Come and Tell me everything you're hoping The Father loves a heart that's open Just come Try to save yourself I know who you are Don't try to be somebody else Come Believe in everything I told you Here are arms that long to hold you Just come Come into the joy of living, knowing that your sins forgiven. Just come. Why didn't I so you could try to save yourself? Don't try to be somebody else Come When your heart is heavy laden Feeling like the joy is faded Won't you come 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 into the joy of living Knowing that your sins forgiven, just come. I love that picture. I really like that.
like Jesus saying, so come on then, let's hang out. How about we do breakfast tomorrow, you know? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thanks for the warning. Thanks for the reminder that uh, self-dependence pretty much sweeps through the entire planet. We even have a day here in America called Independence Day. But uh, thanks for not giving up on the disciples. Thanks for not giving up on Moses or Elijah or Abraham or David or Joshua or Hezekiah. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for inviting us into fellowship into friendship, into relationship, and promising that if we'll spend time with you, you'll take care of what needs to be taken care of in us. That's good news. And I'm so excited that we could find it right there in Revelation 17 and 18. How good of you to give us these object lessons and these encouraging words. We thank you for that. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen.